How's it going everybody? Kevin here and today I have a very special video for you. It's a bit of a podcast kind of video where I sat down with Colby Payne, a former 343 employee who helped create a lot of the open environments and engagements within Zeta Halo. Places like Outpost, forward operating bases, and general gameplay encounters within the open world of Zeta Halo. So I sat down with him, talked about how that process is like creating it at 343, what's it like working with the Slip Space Engine. Also talking about that transition of working in the office to home during the pandemic when it first hit 343 and also the news that he made when he left 343 which caught him off guard as well this is a long video so i suggest probably tuning on this bit of a podcast kind of video if you do want to see more content like this make sure you tap that like button it really does help out the video and try to get a better place within that youtube algorithm as longer videos like this tend to struggle a little bit but i thought it was a really good discussion a lot of really good points that were brought up throughout this video and if you would like to see me interview more people within the halo community or 343 developers make sure to leave a comment down below who you'd like to see next timestamps in the description and and also in this video as well if you want to just kind of jump around to exactly what you want to listen to but you want to listen to the whole thing trust me it's some good stuff so without further ado let's jump right into the content here colby thank you very much for taking the time out of your day to chat with me i think you're one of the i think you're one of the few people i've seen on twitter who's like been pretty active with the halo community i'd say during your time working on halo it's always kind of cool to get the kind of insight from people who are actually like you know behind the curtain kind of thing in a way yeah, um, for sure. Definitely have played through some of your areas that you created within the Zeta Halo, Annex Ridge, uh, Redoubt Sundering, uh, Armory of Reckoning, and Fob Hotel. That's, that, that, those are some of the stuff that I mainly did, uh, like the level design uh, mm -hmm. for. There's still a lot of stuff that I haven't put on my portfolio that I've thought, like the gameplay and other stuff I've set up. Oh, really? Like uh, what, what other kind of stuff? Uh, well, a lot of the designers on the campaign team kind of work together. And so like we'd always get bugs on certain things that weren't necessarily ours and we'd, we, we would be able to vamp up the gameplay a bit. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of us got to be a part of like a lot of the HVTs and the, the Marine events. Ooh, cool. And then also like the, the forward operating bases. I did a lot of the like the encounter work for the forward operating bases. Mm -hmm. Like I said, a lot of a lot of the designers were like took part in like all of that together. So it's like a whole collective team effort. Um I think I like almost every open world encounter I had a a small small hand in Oh really? The HVTs. A lot of those I set up the combat and like all the encounters for those. Mm -hmm. But then I'm 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 sure like soon when I left like there would be more bugs on stuff and uh, some designers may come across something that they could like make make feel better or uh, just make the, the gameplay feel better. So uh, just a lot of us had a, a a lot of us had our hands in a lot of the gameplay all over the all, all over the Halo ring. And did you focus mainly on the uh, the open world sections or was it some of the interior stuff or just kind of like all throughout the campaign or mostly the, the open world stuff? Yeah, I mostly focused on just uh, out in the open world. The main focus of like my level design work was on the outposts. It was me and another designer. His name's Nick. Um, mm -hmm. He, him, him, and I were on the outpost team, and we we're the sole, like the main level designers to create those outposts. Well, some pretty good variety. Like obviously, like the thumbnail you know, felt like it was kind of like like Lego pieces put together in a way where like you had like kind of like the same kind of materials, but then like re rearrange them in certain ways or in different kind of environments that they play out like totally different. Of course, also I think mm -hmm. it wasn't the. Um, uh, I can't remember the one. There was like one four operating base where like this next to like a big open lake and kind of like, I think that's the one where there's actually fight against like a like a wraith if I remember correctly. Or do the do the encounters kind of randomize a little bit or is it all kind yeah. of uh like how's that whole process work? Or I guess like are they kind of randomized a little bit or are they all look kind of the same thing every time? Because I've only been able to play through like once through, so I can't really notice any kind of pattern so far. Yeah, uh, I think that that Ford operating operating base you're referring to is we internally. I know that it's like Fob Cherry. That mm -hmm. was like the internal name. That one I remember because I did that gameplay uh, pretty early on after I was learning um, how to use like the gameplay and encounter tools. Um, and I remember playing or designing that, and then one of the leads came back and said, "Hey, who did this uh, Ford operating base?" And I was like, uh, "I did." And he's like, that's a great job. Like, it really felt like the Banish were actually, like, living there and nice. they were a part of the world there. And I was like, oh, heck yeah. You're so like, oh, that was, yeah. That's amazing. Like, yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah, that that, that was all me. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> but, yeah, a lot of designers helped with that, too. But I remember setting up the initial encounter for that. Uh, you said, like, because some, cause sometimes you uh, come up to some of the forward operating bases and some things would be different. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the designers, uh, his name's Jace, he set up like a, what was it called? It's like a randomizer. Um, he set up a randomizer that would allow us to set up different types of encounters if uh, the player approaches it. 
Um, and it could spawn like one of the three, one of the four encounters that we uh, created in that space. So a lot of the times, uh, no player, well, there weren't that many randomized, but like mo some players will have a different experience at those fobs compared to another, depending on what spawned there. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, true. Yeah, that's right. Because they had the, spawn there. Yeah, that's right. Because there was the uh, dynamic spawn system with the enemies, right? Where depending on what uh, the player is using at that point, you'd see enemies that could counter that the player essentially, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I think the I think the engineering and programming uh, side, like all, all the people working on that, would like check the state of the player. Um, that's a little too far technical in my expertise of mm -hmm. game design, but. They would they would do some cool things to like check the players load out uh, just to see what they could like counter it or just make it more fun for the player now uh i had a question about uh interesting time i'm sure in development uh because i wasn't quite sure like when when was your last date at uh at 343 it was, it was sometime in 2020 right uh, it was 2021 like i think my last day was like january 3rd or okay. 5th 2021 yeah yeah so you you joined with 343 back in 2019 and so mm -hmm. I kind of want to know, like, what was the experience of when the pandemic hit on development? Or like, what was that experience like going from like in office to having to work from home? Like, was it like for you, was that pretty easy or was it kind of like there were some bumps along the way or like how was that kind of experience? Yeah, I think for me, it was more it was pretty easy to transfer or like to go back to go to work from home after being in the studio because I joined in like April 2019 and then. Uh, all the fun stuff hit and we were forced not forced but we were told that hey you got to go work from home mm -hmm. that was like in march 2020 um so i had just under a year of being in the studio and seeing everybody making friends and all that uh it was a really fun time but i think just because i was so new in the industry and i was only in the studio like a fast-paced triple a studio for like a less than a year um it was, it was a pretty easy transition for me to go work from home because uh, I, I enjoy i'm a, I'm a big homebody um uh, i enjoy being at home same. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so being able to just wake up and walk across my hallway to to work was awesome. Yeah, uh, especially around here in the Seattle area, it's so hard to find like something that's close to work that's like affordable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I lived in I lived like two blocks away from the studio, and when I first moved up up, up there in Redmond, and it was so expensive and it was so small, and but it was cool because I could walk to work and then I could go home because we recently got a. Our, our puppy at that time and i can go home and during lunch and at any time i want to take care of him but it was really nice to mm -hmm. be that close but I, I really enjoy working from home now like it's it's my go-to thing yeah it's like i've been working from home since like march of 2020 like pretty much right when the pandemic hit um i don't even know if our company still has an office anymore <laughs> like we, i've heard no news about going back into the office from them at all <laughs> um but i'm actually i'm really enjoying the whole working from home situation save so much money not having to buy gas oh my gosh awesome. yeah <laughs> but that also kind of makes our car feel a little useless because it just kind of sits there <laughs> yeah i thought about like like downsizing to one car uh but with a baby on the way and mm. I, don't, I don't know if that's the best idea so because one of yeah i don't think uh, we'll just keep both cars but yeah some cars seem kind of useless right now so you said it felt pretty easy was um was there anything like uh do you were you able to like, did you just like work on your own like home computer when working from home? Or was it kind of like, like you were received from hi some hardware from Microsoft that was like officially like, you know, safeguarded and stuff like that? Oh, yeah. Um, we would just, they would just say, hey, pack up your machine at the studio and bring it home. But we'd have to set up like all the security measures and stuff. This like every, every studio is doing with a VPN and certain connections and all that making sure the hard drive is safeguarded and all that all the all the good stuff because you know halo is a big ip and you wouldn't want any anything to get out mm -hmm. uh, accidentally so but yeah they, they took some pretty good precautions uh, when we took all our like our machines home and whatnot so um another question i wanted to talk about was uh how you felt about your experience uh when you left uh you made a little bit of news <laughs> <laughs> When you left, um, yeah, I remember one, that. Yeah, this one article right here from uh, NME, like new, was talking about news saying that Halo Infinite game designer leaves three four three Industries for Gunfire Games. It's uh, currently unclear if the developer departed from three four three Industries because they had finished his work on Halo Infinite or felt the studio earlier than expected. But what was that experience like? When you're like, I'm making news from transferring jobs and stuff like that. Usually, usually don't. Usually, when you get a new job, you don't get like news articles written about it. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was definitely a weird experience because, yeah, like my contract was ending, but you know, uh, 
because of the delay, we were able to like extend our contracts. But yeah, I went to Gunfire Games. It, it was a fun time, um, but it, that was another contract. And then I landed a full-time uh, position where I'm at now, and I love it. My lead was more than willing to help me out, like find other like other jobs or whatnot, because he's like, man, once you work on Halo, you can go anywhere. And it's, it, I thought it was like, nah, that, that won't happen. But it kind of did happen. Really? Like as soon as I had like Halo on my resume, um, I had more, like a lot more interviews go like all the way and I was able to like decline offers and whatnot. When I announced that I was leaving, um, I think it was in a little bit of a dry spot for Halo news. Yeah, it was. Um, cause, cause, <laughs> it was. Yeah, we, we recently <laughs> delayed. Um, we kind of went quiet as we were trying to make the game as polished as it can be. Mm. Uh, so I think that kind of like some like someone leaving, especially being a part of the campaign because no one's because of the campaign delay and all that. Um, they're like, oh my gosh, I got to make a news article and so many different like games. I think GameSpots was the biggest one, but there's so many news articles. When I tweeted that out, uh, it was like <laughs> the started blowing up and I was like, what is going on? Did I, did I mess up? What did I do? Am I, am I, is my career ruined just because I said I was leaving? Yeah. And it's just complete normal for contractors to finish their contract and then move on to another, like another game, another studio. Cause my contract was originally for to like finish Halo and launch it when it was supposed to launch in 2020. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, of course, uh, well, fortunately we delayed, uh, which is great because uh, all the polish definitely paid off. But then they extended the contract because um, we still needed work to be done. But yeah, I, I announced that I was leaving. And then I think like one or two days later, all these news articles, GameSpot, <laughs> like, yeah, like I said, GameSpot was the biggest one, but GameSpot like put it like a kind of, I called him out on Twitter, like it was like a clickbait article and it said like Halo uh, gameplay designer leaves for uh, the Darksider studio because uh, that's what Gunfire Games is uh, known for. And it kind of got a lot of a lot of views. And I replied to it on Twitter and said, hey, guys, like my contract ended. I found another job like there's no need to make clickbait out. <laughs> I, I remember that this. tweet. Too. I was like, <laughs> I think that was one of the few times I saw like someone kind of go like, dude, it's just this is par for the course. <laughs> it's like, this is what, how things happen. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Uh, yeah, like, a lot of people don't know how contracting works much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because like, I think maybe just kind of like, they saw like another person leave, because like, I was looking through this article, they mentioned about like Tim Longo and Mary also, and then like, get Chris Lee leave. And then they see yeah, someone else leave the studio. Me's in there. <laughs> yeah, and, and, they, and they see someone else leave, they're like, oh my God, things must be in shambles. Or I need, or things are really quiet on Halo. I need to make an article about this. Yeah, but Halo gets views, and especially after that delay, they're like, "Oh, that's gonna get a lot of views." And I think when I called out GameSpot, I like ratioed their Twitter. Like my reply had like way more interaction. <laughs> You'll love to um, see it, man. <laughs> it, it was. I think I had like seven hundred thousand, um, seven hundred thousand views in my Twitter profile that that month. Oh, it's wow. pretty wild. Yeah, like <laughs> all that news. It, it was like I, I think I locked my Twitter account at one point because I was still super overwhelmed. Um, I, can I, imagine, I was yeah. watching all these YouTube videos about it as I seen my name. I was like, "This is ridiculous, man!" I just I got a new job. <laughs> yeah, it was cool to it's cool to see it. I think one guy was like, "The, the balls on this guy for calling out Gamespot." It was like it was one of the funniest videos I watched. But he was like, "This guy is awesome. Like this developer is awesome for calling out Gamespot and their." the clickbait because that's what a lot of game journalists do is oh, yeah. clickbait all the clicks because you know they get all the ad revenue but he it was just a funny video he's like i like this colby he's a cool guy i call him out <laughs> i appreciate it too yeah because like if someone's gonna set the record straight it would be you to be like guys no there's nothing to see here <laughs> yeah so i guess again i want to talk about like we're talking about a little bit on how like contract work is um when you first got like hired on, do you feel like there was a bit of time to kind of like for like ramp up time when it came to working? Because at least from my experience, whenever I get a new job, I'm like I need like at least like three months to at least get like a, keep up keep up with some of the full time employees or people that have been working there longer. Was it like working with the uh, Slipspace engine in Halo Infinite? Like and I saw that you did some work with like Unreal Four in uh, on your workstation. So like. And I think a lot of people can use that as a good frame of reference. Like, how is it working with like slip space compared to like other kinds of engines? The ramp up time, if I remember, wasn't too long. I think like just like three months, um, or maybe less than that, uh, depending on like the type of like if you're a designer or an artist on the project. But since me only being uh, like straight out of college, I still had a lot of like a lot. I didn't have all that industry experience um so jumping into a big true play studio working on such an iconic franchise was a little overwhelming at first um really learning <laughs> you must did you feel like hey i guess this call thing kind of paid off 
<laughs> like, yeah, it, it helped a little bit. I still to teach a lot of my a lot of stuff on my own, and going back to the ramp up on Halo, like it was maybe three months to ramp up on like the project and learn what they were wanted to achieve with it. Uh, when I because when I first interviewed, I didn't know Halo Infinite was going to be open world at all, and mm. when I joined the studio, I was like, "Hey, you ready to make an open world Halo?" I'm like what the heck open world halo <laughs> um, that was even was like, like it the, wasn't even mentioned in the interview at all but like what you might have to do um, <laughs> uh, they were super secretive um yeah. some of the stuff i had to do for the test was kind of alluding to it but me being so excited and new in the industry i kind of didn't put two and two together because mm. i think i like my original test was like a like a classic linear halo level and i don't think that's what they wanted but you know they still liked what i did and like my personality and I connected well with my lead, so it was, it, was, it was a good time. But at the ramp of time, three months, learning the slip space engine, what's the best word for it? Sometimes it was kind of slow because, you know, they were they were building the engine at the same time. Um, so with with new tech comes online, a lot of a lot of issue, a lot of issues and whatnot. But oh, yeah. uh, I, as a designer, I was able to work with the engineering team and the program team very closely to create like a this is a good relationship between the designers to see what we would need from the engine. To make our lives better and make so we can design more fun intuitive things so working with uh like the engineers on that was a lot of fun for like certain uh the certain things we needed on the engine it was a little bit different than what i'm used to with like unity or unreal engine uh, especially with ue4 being so mainline and like the main go-to AAA engine right now doing all my school work in that and then jumping onto this brand or this new uh engine that was still being built uh, it was pretty daunting at times, but uh, you, once you once you're in that engine all day every day, uh, you learn pretty quick and all the ins nice. and outs and shortcuts to make your life a lot easier. So mm -hmm. uh, when they, when everything was online, it was a lot of fun uh, designing the engine. But with you know each engine comes its issues. Even Unreal still has its issues of the things you're trying to create. Oh yeah. Uh, but I think they wanted to update that engine just so they could achieve that open world uh, aspect on the on the ring. But I remember like. In the slip space engine, all, all like the fusion coils were placing. Uh, we all know we love the fusion coils. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> they make those... it so much more fun now on the infinite. <laughs> Being able to throw them. Those... Oh, my God. It's amazing. <laughs> those were those were a lot of fun. Uh, but sometimes designing with them, like placing them in certain areas, um, like because they're a dynamic object, which means like, you know, it's movable from the player or like within the environment. Mm -hmm. um, so like we we're able to pick them up and throw them. But sometimes like if you place them in the engine and they, they like fell from a distance, it would like blow up and sometimes like crash because like because it's a big explosion and like the, i don't think the engine was prepared for like a big explosion at that time sometimes it would crash but <laughs> it's just funny to like make big uh sometimes i just throw in a bunch of fusion coils and then drop one fusion coil from like a, <laughs> like 20 feet up and just watch a big explosion it was a lot of fun oh uh, bring it back around with that bring, bring it back some old halo 3 forge memories right there for me on that one. <laughs> oh, oh yeah i think i, I think all everyone who's ever opened up forge has done that at least at least once <laughs> oh 100 percent you have to and you mentioned this, touched on it a little bit earlier as well about saying how collaborative the process is i'm kind of curious like um when it comes to like the creating an area within the world right how collaborative it is but like how much like uh, creative freedom do you get with those uh, opportunities yeah we were we were able to get a pretty large amount of creative freedom we were tasked with an outpost and they, they had a certain theme and objectives to um to like finish in the in there mm -hmm. um, so like uh if you go back to some of the ones i did the army of reckoning that's like a big shooting range if you look in the middle of the outpost uh the, the banish have set up all this broken unsc the, all the armor from the marines and some of the score like a broken scorpions there and you can see all like the bullet holes and dents and like all the stuff they're shooting at because mm -hmm. they were it was initially going to be like a weapons a weapons testing facility had based that whole outpost on on that firing range theme and then we put literally every single gun in the game that was uh that was available to the player inside locked inside that one uh big building that's in that outpost and the player's objective was to figure out a way to get into that um building and at first it was it used to be just you could just walk in and do whatever you want but then we changed some of the objectives around and we had some cool uh, late, like laser cut tunnel systems that I wanted to include in there because it was a cool space. Oh yeah, and mm -hmm. trying to just just have the player move through the space by making them go under, and we include an, an objective under there to like lead the player so they can actually get inside the building if they continue on through the laser cut cave there. Mm -hmm. 
So we, we had we had a lot of creative freedom where we could design. We said to keep it within a certain size because uh, the way we designed that, there's certain uh, layers that we had to stay in so we could all work on the ring at the same time, but just different areas. We said a certain size that we had to keep it to, or if I needed to um, go larger, I just have to chat with like, hey, I'm trying to accomplish this. And so we, we had a lot of creative freedom what we could do. We said to keep it in a certain area and make sure we get the theming correctly in each area. When it comes to the aesthetics of the whole thing do you kind of do like a like a block out of the area first and then textures happen or is it just kind of like you receive these different kinds of assets and you just kind of like piece them together in some cool way uh we, what what they had was um they were called kits so a lot of the like banished buildings and some of the smaller assets were all just set in a kit so we could place the object in and um you could scroll through all the different types of um like banish buildings and interiors so we were able to pretty much customized how we wanted the interiors to look based off a certain amount of kits uh so like this one building could have 10 or more different configurations inside it so we were able to customize it a bit on how we wanted uh the interiors to look like and feel like for gameplay uh but then if we needed to get more creative um i think it's the first outpost you come across for the big silos like around you jump onto the ring i forgot that one's called oh yeah but like it's like one of the first ones you interact with i think yeah, they showed it in the trailers yeah, yeah, it was a big like part of the hype trailer. Um, yeah, yeah, that outpost, the interior of the big building where you get the scorpion, that one was like fully custom made by the designer, um, so they could fit the the objectives and the theme across in that outpost. But then, um, like the artist would uh, make all the required like changes and make it look all nice and pretty and okay. make sure it's functional. Uh, so it's, at certain times, we were able to uh be pretty concise of what we wanted to design but uh, a lot of times it was uh just placing objects uh and getting like the good block out feel and then eventually everything would come online but i think i joined in a time of development where a lot of the assets were online but not fully like uh polished up mm -hmm. not in that like actual beta phase ready to be like shippable um so a lot of my work uh was still a lot of like block out work but like actually using full-on like textured and modeled art assets. So on Halo, I didn't have a lot of a lot of time to like to actually do like basic gray block block at work that you do pretty early on in development, just because it was uh, it was so far in development at the time. And joining that was a lot of fun because I was able to like it kind of felt like you're playing Forge, yeah, right. like just using <laughs> using all of these Halo assets um, to make this cool badass banished base. Mm -hmm. uh, so like at times it felt like Forge because I was just creating stuff that I used to and on Halo Three. I was like, I feel like I'm in high school again, creating you know, <laughs> levels in my on my controller in my basement. Right. Um. So it was a lot of fun just using uh just being able to throw everything together to create uh some of the cool banish outposts. That's awesome, dude. Yeah. So it sounds like you kind of like when you got in, it's just kind of like you hit the floor running. And you just like would just start creating. Yeah, we jump right in. Had the small ramp up time, learn about a project, read all the documents, and then just thrown right into it. Like, hey, here's your outpost. This is the what you have to do. At first, a bit, I, I got to play around with what they call like game designs. Like you, you check something out from the from the the repo, you know. But like it was called like a scratch checkout. So like all the stuff I did didn't like actually change the game. So I was able to like fully jump in and learn the tools and the train editor and everything the engine has to offer. Um, and then after I was I was feeling comfortable with the engine, they're like, all right, here's the first thing you're doing to start working on this outpost. Uh, when I would join, I think it was like maybe three or four months i was already working on the first outpost so um when it comes to creating stuff i'm sure you have like intentions of how players would go about playing it but with like with the openness of halo infinite's campaign have you seen anybody who's like playing sections of, of like the parts you worked on you're like oh man you missed you totally missed that cool part or you're not playing it as intended or is it all just kind of like as, as long as you're enjoying it it's all good yeah there were some parts um i was like I didn't play. They didn't play it as intended. Uh, but like, like you said, with the open world game, the player is going to come from any direction, and there's no way, uh, like us as designers, can account for every possible scenario, mm -hmm. uh, especially in an open world game. The linear levels, of course, all of like the foreigner linear stuff, um, is pretty is an intended way. But like with the outpost, you can grapple hook right over a wall and jump right in. Or I, I like I think the best thing is taking a Razorback full of Marines with a Sentinel beam. Oh, yeah. it's the coolest thing. Um, <laughs> you just melt uh, everything in your way when you do that. Yeah, like I, those things just melt. It's crazy. It pads up my game time so much, but I'm always like grabbing a Razorback, packing it full of Marines, trying to get them to follow me, giving them like you know really powerful weapons, then going into a base. But it's just like that's just like such a 
unique, cool experience with Halo Infinite that like I just can't help but just do it every single time I play. Yeah, I I enjoy that aspect of that. But like as a designer, you can't really um like account for every direction the player is going to approach the the base. You try to account for some of the directions, or just like northeast, south, and west. It's a general direction of how the player can approach from this a certain spot, and try to create a like a unique and intuitive a gameplay moment for the player on like each side. Um, so that was something uh, I tried to do with each outpost. One thing with the Annex Ridge outpost, there's two levels to it. So there's a top and a bottom. And that bottom area was was designed around an actual objective uh, to like activate the elevator. And there's a whole objective in there. That's why there's some uh, like actual banished buildings in the back tucked away away from the elevator. And the objective was to like sneak through the main gate that's down below and take the like the main like stick to the forerunner uh, hex pillars. And you can stick along that ridge and find a sniper uh, and you can take out that jackal sniper without anyone knowing that you're there and then you can just unleash hell with the sniper rifle um to like clear out the base and get to the objective i'm looking at the picture and this one, i'm like yeah now nah, i think i actually kind of did it where i actually might have played it wrong because i came i didn't <laughs> come, i didn't come from the bottom i came from uh like the top side kind of like on the mm -hmm. opposite of that elevator side when i played through this section and i by like played through it like you know, broke through, you know, got through that, through the gate and stuff like that. I kind of worked my way from the opposite way of going towards the elevator rather than going to the elevator, going up then into the environment. But mm -hmm. uh, it's still a lot of fun to play. That. that was actually one of my favorite uh, outposts to play in just because it was such a, it felt way more unique compared to some of the other ones. I think mainly just because yeah. like that, that they, had, they were doing like that forerunner research facility kind of thing that was going on with that. And then obviously yeah, the theming of that was pretty strong for that one. Like there's like some kind of ship or something that you blow up and then like some things kind of collapse and like stay collapsed and are like on fire. So I feel like you're really kind of like changing the world while you're there, which is like a really cool experience to have. Like I really felt like it was a, a dynamic experience playing that level for sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I'm I, sorry. I, I played it wrong. <laughs> no, it, there's, there's no, there's no right or wrong way to, to play, play the outposts. Oh, that one, that's definitely my favorite one. Just because of like the theming of that with the foreigner artifacts that they're testing it and finding, trying to extract information. Even if you look in the big building there, they have a ring into that building and they're, you can see the hologram of the ring that they're studying it. Mm -hmm. um, so it was really fun to design that. But if you actually approach from the elevator, the way when you get up on top of the outpost, you can see the framing is set up uh, pretty perfect to see uh, the foreigner ring that's that they're that they dug out and they're oh, ready yeah. to extract. Mm -hmm. uh, compared to the other side where there's a small gate um if you come from that angle you get the framing on that isn't the best because originally it, the original way to play it was to go down below and then come up top but since the players can approach it from any way uh, you can't account for that um mm -hmm. but i think the fob that's next to the outpost leads the players to the fob more and then they're like okay here's an outpost now i'll go take it out right i think it's i think it's what kind of happened with me on that one yeah <laughs> mm -hmm. I, even i even i did that in my playthroughs like i'm gonna go get all the fobs and like okay but then i went around uh the outpost and did it the way i designed it because i was like i'm gonna play it my way <laughs> <laughs> that's the great thing about halo infinite man there's like you play it your way you know and exactly. everyone, everyone's playthrough is different every experience is different like no one no two play sessions are going to be the same which makes the campaign so cool. But now I guess next time I play through, I'll have to play through it the right way. Because you can even get the, there's a there's a ghost in the back of that building that's hanging by the, the edge of the, like the hex pillars mm -hmm. that's behind the building. You can use that to go up the elevator. And because that whole area at the top is designed for a ghost to be roaming around and you mm -hmm. can fit through everything uh, within a, within the ghost. Was there something that you wanted to do or thought that would be really cool to do, but just either didn't have the time or the resources or the like, um, uh, assets to really make it work out or do you feel like you're able to kind of accomplish everything that you wanted to do with the game uh i feel like i accomplished everything i wanted to do um but like i said stuff has been cut i've had other outposts that were cut that unfortunately won't see the light of day um one of them was like on this big hex area so it was the whole area whole outpost was going to be nothing but like the the hex pillars i designed a really cool base that i would loop the player around and finally get up to the top um, so it was a cool experience on foot, but then, you know, with the wasp and the grapple hook and the movement, you can kind of just skip everything and get to the top. So that one, unfortunately, didn't really work out just because the movement within the game didn't like, uh, like just the outpost wasn't designed around the movement in the game, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But that, that's uh -huh. one thing I wish would have stayed because, uh, 
having the outpost, nothing on, but nothing but the hex pillars was pretty cool. It was a lot of fun to play. That sounds pretty cool, but again, like you said, like it fit, fits the gameplay properly because I know like a lot of people pretty much kind of stuck with like, at least from my experience and what from other people I've seen, like they kind of just stick with like the grapple shot and will just kind of like, you know, chain their way up any kind of vertical place if that's where they need to be, you know? Yeah, I didn't even know like the cooldown on the grapple, the grapple shot was going to be that, like that fast. Yeah, it's kind of um, quick. <laughs> so now I know that outpost won't work at all because the cooldown on that grapple hook was so, so fast. And I designed like the upper area just out of reach of the player's grapple, but then you can just stuff Spider Man your way up. And all I was right. like, okay, that outpost never would have worked because you would skip everything unless you build like an objective around to push the player. Um, but at that time, that outpost didn't have an objective. But I think we mm. could have done something cool if we added objectives and the outpost could have stayed. But I think that whole area was cut anyways. More questions, if you don't mind. Uh, these are actually yeah. from the community here uh, that I reached out to some people on, on my Discord. Uh, Vex Arrow I, he asked, uh, yeah, I, I kind of summarized it, but essentially he asked, uh, like with the limited settings being like Forerunner, Banished, and Woodlands kind of in biomes, uh, did you have any challenges when it comes to making a area feel more unique? Um, I, I, me personally, I know some of the stuff was limited with the biomes and all that. Um, but like as a designer, I, don't, I didn't feel like I was going down to it like a creator's block just because I was kind of limited on what I had to use. I think having the all these different outposts being themed a certain type of way helped a lot because we were able to really showcase that theme within the outpost. And at times we would need certain assets to sell the theme. So a lot of stuff was made strictly for these outposts, which sometimes isn't the best thing to do for game design because you kind of want to reuse as much as you can because making a whole new asset that you're only going to use in one place is very expensive. I'm not saying like money wise, but like you're paying someone to do that and you're only going to use it once. It's just not like the best thing exactly. for the game. Well, time is money, you know, kind of thing. Ex exactly. Yeah. So you, we tried to stay away from those types of things but some of the outposts were themed so differently that we had to like going back to annex ridge um blowing up that ship that was holding the foreigner rings was specifically made for that outpost um to sell the idea that they've advanced their tech to haul off the haul these rings off to uh, another planet or off world somewhere to study them further uh, so if you look you shouldn't be able to see that uh forerunner like ship that the Banish have at all, because that was strictly made for that outpost. I, I had what I needed to create uh, unique and fun like levels and outposts within uh, within Halo Infinite. Um, going back to some of the stuff was kind of limited, but um, I think the surrounding areas, because uh, a lot of the surrounding areas were designed before these outposts, so I was able to continue on a theme of what the environment artists already made for that area. Where the Annex Ridge is, there's a lot of hex areas, so I was able to kind of segregate and had to have two different types of outposts uh for that because a bottom and a top to that so i was able to keep the theme of all those hexes in the area so i think having environment artists help on how we can be creative within these outposts and spaces helped a lot because you know they they've done all the environment work around these areas so they know the theme of this area um, so having them uh work with closely with us was a re really helpful uh, when at times I did feel a little lost on what I could do with the outpost. So he's like a senior environment artist named Steve. He's awesome. He helped me quite a bit on my outpost and how we could keep that same theme for the outpost that was in the surrounding area. So I think that helped a lot. That was just my experience. Maybe some other designers could be a little limited to what they made. You never really felt like you had like a like a writer's block kind of thing when it comes to putting things together. Because was I guess no. with a, each, you seem to sound like each sec section, you were kind of given a task of like, hey, we're trying to do like a armory or we're trying to do like a research facility so there's always kind of like some theme already kind of established and you kind of had to help create that experience mm -hmm. yeah I, I didn't feel like i had a writer's block but sometimes there was because i just like my current tool set isn't what i need and then that's when we were able to work with the environment team uh to like hey we need different assets for this outpost to sell the theme and you know if y'all it doesn't hurt to ask for things you need and you'll get them in, in return if you know there's a big want and need for it and a lot of the stuff I had to design, I was like, we need to sell this idea further. And it's just working closely with the environment team because game designers, level designers who worked always, always directly with um, the environment artists because, you know, it's, it takes, it takes a load to make a game. Mm -hmm. um, but like working together in certain aspects helped a lot. But the first outpost I did, I was like, hey, I need a cluster of rocks or trees here. And then the environment artist was like, how about we don't do that? And we do something like this and change that up. I'm like, okay, that's way better. So oh, cool. working directly with them helped out a lot. If I had a 
writer's block or anything like that. Actually, I would say like out of the uh, like some of the outposts, uh, my first like wow moment I had with one of the outposts was actually the redout of sundering, where if that was like the first time I really felt like I like accrued like a really or uh, should say I really got like a really unique experience I never really had in Halo before. I remember mm -hmm. like, kind of like starting one way and kind of working my way through the entirety of the outpost, and as I was doing, it, I was you know freeing these marines, trying to keep them alive as well. But then after after I kind of freed them, I had like a squad of like twelve marines following me up this hill to take on. I think like the ultimate guy was like a roof chief chieftain or something like that. And I actually, really just kind of just had like this wow moment. I was able to create like this battalion of, of marines like on the fly, and they were all helping me out. Like if it was just like such a cool experience. Like I know we've like, kind of like had that similar thing with Halo, but like I felt like I created it in a way or created this kind of experience. That, that's awesome. That's mm -hmm. awesome to hear because I always like seeing what people. Like thought of the spaces I made a lot of the outposts kind of I recently said like the outposts make you feel like master chief at times because you know your humanity's last hope going into this banished outpost to save some marines and you know do what chief does best mm -hmm. and getting like those the small marine groups to fight with you through the outpost is pretty cool you know I was able to like cater the outpost to the objectives around there uh, I think the outpost was supposed to be a prison processing uh, outpost. Like they would go there mm -hmm. for questioning or like, I don't know if they torture. Um, I don't know the lore, but they would go there and then they would ship them off to actually like that, the the big um, outpost or the big, uh, the big tower. Mm -hmm. That was just kind of the story and lore behind that. So they would go there first and then they would be shipped off to the big, uh, big tower where you meet. They added like all like the banished intercom over, like, you mm -hmm. know, when the banished officer comes on and he checks in on the state of the outpost all that stuff was added after i left so that was a cool thing to see as well oh yeah that definitely added like so much more yeah. atmosphere to it. it may feel more like an actual place you know like, mm -hmm. the banished are working in you would hear like yeah. you know over the intercom like check up all the prisoners and make sure i think <laughs> I, I think some of them were talking about like how tasty they are too or something like that yeah i guess the banished eat people yeah <laughs> <laughs> i mean yeah I don't think there's really much in the way of farming happening on Zeta Halo, so I mean, you gotta make do what you have, right? Right. <laughs> well, uh, Colby, I think that's like all the questions I have for you. I actually went a little bit longer than I thought I was ex expecting to go, but you know, hey, yeah, got me talking about Halo. Oh, yeah, I can, right? talk, I can talk your ear off for sure. <laughs> talk about Halo all day. <laughs> so uh, I guess what, what you got going for yourself right now, since you mentioned that you're working with uh, Team Down in Austin, right? Like how we're talking about this a little early, they're kind of in the early stages, but uh like, so what do, you, what, what do you have going on for yourself right now and moving forward? Just working at Archetype Entertainment. I'm an associate level designer there. Working on some cool stuff. Can't say much, unfortunately. Well, I guess, uh, Colby, I guess that's pretty much everything I have for you. I mean, I kept you for, that look, God, it looks like an hour now at this point. <laughs> ah, it was a great time. Yeah, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to chat and uh, provide some cool insights when it comes to, like, you know, how the uh, how the sausage is made a little bit when it comes to putting together a Halo game. So thank you so much for watching, guys. I really do appreciate it. Again, link to all Colby stuff, like it's Art Station, Twitter, and stuff like that. It's in the description and in the pinned comment down below. Again, if you want to see some more content like this, let me know in the comment section down below. I do read all the comments and try to reply to most of them as well. I'll catch you all in the next one. Peace out.